Sam Reed, thank you so much for joining me today. No, thank you for having me, Naomi. You know what? Don't you don't you be nice. Don't you be sweet, okay? <laughs> because I'm coming in here and I'm mad at you. I'm mad at you, <laughs> Sam Reed. Because my first question is this. How dare you? Okay? That's what I have to say. <laughs> what are you referring to? Exactly. <laughs> <Which bit? laughs> Here's what I think of Lestat. I think that Lestat is a messy bitch who lives for drama. Sure. Okay? Sure. <laughs> What did you know about Lestat going into the audition? I mean, I, I knew the books. I've known them for a very, very long time. I had read that they were making it, and I was very excited, and I sort of hoped that I would get the chance to do an audition for it. The thing that freaked me out a little bit about that audition was that majority of that audition was in French. Oh, wow. And it said, it said, had all the lines in English, but it said in parentheses, in French. And so, you know, I studied French in school. My sister speaks fluent French, but I am not that good at French. So I spent a lot of time <laughs> learning French. So that was quite stressful. I saw a little bit, you and Jacob, you did your sort of chemistry test over Zoom, yeah. which, you know, I mean, does anyone have chemistry over Zoom? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's so yeah. tough. Yeah. It, 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 I, yeah. I don't really know what they were looking for or how you're supposed to gauge <laughs> chemistry as well from that, because it was really glitchy and we were like speaking on top of each other and, you know, trying really hard to like <laughs> act into the camera, um, which just wasn't working. Um, but, you know, I, I, look, I really, Jacob is such a lovely person, such a really fantastic actor and so easy to be around. And, um, you know, I can see that he was going to be a very easy person to fall in love with. So it was fun. In fact, we I just came from having ice cream with Jacob and he says hello. Oh, my God, I'm obsessed. I want I want these moments because give me that footage. OK, I want ice cream. Footage. Yeah, yeah. I want strolling the streets <laughs> of downtown New Orleans footage. Yeah. I and mean, we hang out all the time when we've become very, very good friends because it is a crazy journey that we're on. And it was a crazy job. So it's, it's really lovely to have such a good friend. I have a question about, you know, because Lestat has had a quite, you know, he's had a life well before the show starts, right? Yeah. And he's been on this journey. And then you have the different versions of Lestat we meet in the book. Yeah. So you're sort of pulling from this amalgamation a little bit. What kind of conversations did you have with the showrunner, Roland Jones, about your version of Lestat? Yeah, well, I think the the premise, and which Roland has done very well, is for Louis to revisit the interview. And so Louis now has a more nuanced you know, way of describing Lestat. So I think that was the first thing that I was most curious about with Roland was, okay, how much of this is real Lestat and how much of this is Louis' perspective of Lestat? Because obviously this is a memory and, um, you know, this is all through Louis' eyes. And is this actually how Lestat is or is he different? And I think we play with that on and off. What is really important about this season or this show was that you are playing a character seen through somebody else's eyes. Right, 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 right. Oh my God, it's a Gordian knot. It's a little bit of a layer for me. What do you say that? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You're like, okay, well, what? It's a big layer. Yeah, like- <laughs> and, and everyone kept telling me, stop thinking about that too much. Just don't think about it. And I didn't, and I don't, I don't think about it too much when I'm doing it. You know, like I, right, right. you know, th- there will come a day, I think, when Lestat turns around and goes, actually, this is how it fucking happened. <laughs> Okay, well, Sam, you're just making me so mad because you're too kind and you're too funny. And I said, no, 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 I've come here with hard-hitting questions and I'm living it, let's start. <laughs> but, <for> it. <laughs> no, but this gets me, though, to what I think is, is so fun about the show and what I think it's doing so right when it comes to a genre story. And that is the humor and the personality. Let's listen to a scene that really captures the humor between these new gay vampire husbands who, of course, are having a conversation in their coffins. I don't like sleeping angry. For the record, if disrespect was done to you, I would have killed him myself. Well, what can I do to make it up to you? I want to buy the fair play saloon. That's ambitious. If you don't want to help, I'll do it myself. Ridiculous of you to mix human and vampire business. It always ends poorly. But how can I stop you? How can I say no to you? I mean, <laughs> Les Stratz <laughs> is out here. Like, it is such a funny moment. For Lestat, he's like, okay. It's like, he's, you, you want to own a club? And I even in that moment, I thought it was so funny because I'm like, Louis, you have unlimited power and unlimited life and what you want is a club. Babe, yeah. dream bigger. <laughs> yeah. Dream bigger. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, I think it goes to show like the how in love Lestat is with Louis, that he's going to, like, you know, give him these things that mean absolutely nothing in the broader context of vampire world. 
But what Lestat doesn't understand is that Louis' humanity and what he needs is that power, you know, and it, it is control over his own mm-hmm. life. So I think um, there's a lesson for both of them right. there. And at this moment, Lestat doesn't understand. Okay, here's another question I have. And this is just, I just need you to tell me because I know there's an answer and it's just making me crazy. Where is Lestat's money coming from? <laughs> I mean, he's got investments and, you know, like he's he's got bankers and he's got uh, lawyers in France. Literally, when he got turned into a vampire, he was given like the most ginormous amount of money, an entire room of treasure. You're giving us so much backstory. I don't even know that. Yeah. If you think about inflation over the years, and then reinvestment. I mean, it's just like an obscene, obscene, obscene amount of money. <laughs> and, and also, if you live through the centuries, you're able to um, follow the trends of markets and understand <laughs> the way. <laughs> that would be like why I would be a, a vampire or like traveling time. You know when people talk about traveling in time and they're always like, I go back and kill Hitler. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I do that too. But also I buy some property. Yeah, exactly. Do you know what I mean? I just really get some good spaces and like I go back to maybe like 1899 when it's cheap mm, or something. Super and cheap. just buy it all up. Yeah, 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 literally. Do you know what I mean? Could you imagine? Right? Park Avenue? One Park Avenue apartment. Can you exactly. imagine? Exactly, exactly. I mean, that's why all the vampires are kind of pretty damn rich, to be honest. Like Louis, 2022 Louis, when he's in Dubai, like he is really <laughs> mega rich. He's got Francis Bacon's. Real? Okay, I didn't even clock. I didn't. I don't think I even clocked it. Yeah, yeah. That guy is rich, like mega rich. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You also know he's rich because his like penthouse is so cold. I feel like rich people <laughs> really like stone floors and sharp edges you know they want to they want you to know that if you're poor you could die in here. yeah exactly and you're never comfortable you're never you're not supposed yeah, to be yeah, comfortable yeah. <laughs> why do you think lestat chose louis because i do think for me as a viewer there is a question from moment one do these two men really love each other mm. are they just kind of entangled mm. you know the whole time you're watching it's like do i want them to be together yeah exactly but being a vampire is hard it's very very difficult to, to endure and to exist forever, basically. Yeah. And you need to have quite a lot of strength and a lot of gumption and a lot of, you know, a, a lot of internal power to be able to endure. And I think Lestat recognizes that in Louis. When he sees him on the street and he sees, holy shit, that very, very, very beautiful man just pull a knife on his brother in the middle of the street to look powerful, to save his own skin. And he has enough strength to do that i think lestat can see this guy has potential to really endure mm. he's also got the hots for him really badly right know, exactly because he rem- yeah <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's also that he tries really hard to be just like a good kind of like normal guy as, <laughs> as best as he can you know and i think when he has dinner with his family you know and he and he screws he screws up he does actually feel quite bad that he's he's made a mess of that because he was trying really hard to be on his best behavior. I mean, instead, he sort of hypnotizes his brother and makes a big scene. <laughs> but, but you know, when he's... <laughs> it's not well, trying to be good, but he just cannot help but hypnotize his brother and make a scene. Yeah, well, you know, like, you know, he starts making innuendos and, and yeah. he brings up God, which is a never good thing for the start. Well, they say never at the dinner table. No religion, no yeah. politics. <laughs> <laughs> no God at the dinner table, yeah. And so he does his absolute best to pretend like he's drinking wine and eating food. <laughs> What was it like to go from COVID isolation to sex scenes? Like to go from literally being like I'm in the house six feet away from everybody to let's show booties, you know? <laughs> um, hmm. What, how do I phrase that? Um, uh, you know what? The sex scenes are the kind of easier part because we're all sort of like in the same little bubble together. And we're getting tested, you know, like every day. It's like constantly testing. So I think that's what what love in the time of the pandemic is really. (laughs) But, um, you know, it was a funny time because we had these mad contacts on and the contacts are quite cloudy. I think Jacob and I really clung to each other a lot of the time because, you know, we couldn't really see. And so we could, could, (laughs) and everyone else has got masks on and, you know, you can only really like just see the person who's just in front of you and you're just sort of like getting through it. And so it was this sort of like very sort of weird languid dream like place, but super fun. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Wait, can we talk a bit more about the the contacts, the makeup, the process of becoming the vampires? I cannot take the nails. <laughs> I could not take nails. Long nails and then cutting everyone. And I'm yeah, like, the oh nails. God. Oh my God. The nails were a real process because the nails originally, they had press on nails, like stick on nails. Um, And I have so much action and grabbing stuff and I'm doing stuff all the time. And my nails are just like po- constantly popping off, like always <laughs> off. And so they said, okay, I think we should, you should get acrylic nails. And it took me a long, long time to get used to having acrylic nails. Yeah. I felt really debilitated because I couldn't pick anything up. And also, like, a lot of people would just come up and talk to me. <laughs> I'd be in a restaurant <laughs> and someone would be like, oh, hey, I love your nails. So it was like a free reign for some people to come up and, like, want to chat. So I, I, yeah. I obviously became um, a nicer looking person with the nails. On, so <laughs> I was, appreciated that. Yeah. <laughs> I get that. It's like nails and also when you have hair. I don't know if your hair has – you've had your hair shorter before, right? It's but usually like, always short. It's like when you have the length, you're like, let me flip it to emphasize <laughs> my point. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the hair – I mean, the, I, mean I, I was really adamant that the hair had to be the hair. My hair was shorter when I first arrived and, and it grew out over the show. And so we extended it with extensions and then it became my own hair. But I remember um, when I first arrived, Roland was like, you know, I think maybe you could have short hair and your hair looks good, like, you know, sort of like – and I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was, it's a, it's like, you know, if you're going to play a character that is like a start, you kind of have to, you know, have the nails and you have to have the hair. It's like very important. And yeah, he does use the hair to, to accentuate things. Yeah. You know, yeah. if he's really pissed off, he'll flip it all the way back, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, there are times where we're almost getting the drag queen level of drama from Lestat. Absolutely. He wants yeah. you and everybody in the 10-mile radius to know when he's mad. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely, yeah. I mean, like you say, it's it's drama. He love, he's loves drama. I, I love him very dearly, so I never want to say anything bad about him. But um, <laughs> <laughs> if he wants to create a bit of drama, he'll create a bit of drama. You know, right, and um, right. um, and if he wants to be really seductive in a moment and then flip it and be really ugly, he will. <laughs> you know what I mean? He does what he wants whenever he wants, and he will make sure that everyone's watching him do it because he knows he looks great doing it. <laughs> <laughs> like, like it's, he's like he's a super vain guy, but his heart is in the right place. Really, I'd say. No, I think nope, he- Sam, nope, no way. <laughs> Sam, no way. I'm just going to have to push back. Okay? I know you played him. I know you researched him. I'm saying you're wrong. <laughs> One thing that I think Rollin does so well that you and Jacob capture is, you know, this is now an interracial relationship. Mm. It charges these questions that Anne was already asking, right? These larger questions of what is it to be human and what is power and what are relationships. Let's just listen to a clip where Louis calls out this power dynamic. This was your man's escort I sent to me, Stitt. I was hungry. Stone throw from your place of business. What were you thinking? Disrespecting me. How did he do that? He told me I did a good job. You are a library of confusion. Something you don't get about America, Lestat. Yes, let's have this conversation again. Colin, white, Creole, French, queer, half queer, mostly queer. What is it? Non-discriminating. <clears throat> Complicated situation we got here is what I'm saying. Couple of Paris priests go missing. People say fine. Most likely kid fiddlers. But this, this was an important man in town. The police will be looking for this man, Fledgling. That's why we got this piece here. No, you need to show restraint, Fledgling. Oh, you need to stop using that word right now because it sounds a little like Don't slave. Say. Well, that's what it fucking sound like. It's what it feel like sometimes. And the carousel comes around again. Fuck you. Do you think that you know, being a vampire, being hundreds of years old. Do you think that Lestat thinks he's above race? Mm, mm. I don't. I don't know if he thinks of it like that. I think he definitely acknowledges the prejudices that exist, and he he acknowledges as soon as he meets Louis. But I think once you've become a vampire, I think you can transcend that, and I think that think that's what Lestat fully misunderstands about Louis' situation. I think he he has a lot to learn Mm -hmm. in that regard. Mm -hmm. Lestat is kind of like, humans are trifles. We don't have time for it. Mm. I mean, Louis believes humanity is worthwhile and he still kind of wants to be a part of it. I think he just doesn't understand yet. I think Louis, at this point, doesn't understand the enormity of living forever. I think it's just, you know, you've just become a vampire. You know, your family's still around. 
I think the hard thing is once you see everyone you know grow old, die, you see wars break out, riots break out, you see politicians change, you see you go through the ages of centuries and you see that humanity is in this fucked up cycle that just continues on the same hamster wheel. And you're this fantastic creature that exists outside of humanity. Like why, why do you, would you need to bother engaging with the you know, small little fancies of these human beings. And, but let's start, you know, he sort of has his choices. Like, do I, do I just fucking live it up and have a good time and, <laughs> and make a joke about it and, 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 and find it funny and find, look for the light moments. Um, mm. He is very oscillating though, you know, so sometimes yeah. the jokes at his own expense and sometimes the jokes at everyone else's expense. <laughs> <laughs> so, but he's the one who's always laughing. But what I would say is that what Lestat does feel about humanity is through art, like there is a beautiful, pure expression. And he really, really respects and admires that and loves musicians and artists. That was where Lestat separated man from food. There was one issue, however, that threatened to pop the bubble of our Italian holiday. And that was the tenor playing Ernesto. And Lestat was unamused. He sat the tenor down, opened up the score in front of him, and sang as it was written. Lestat removed a lifetime of confidence, of joy, in less than half an hour. Ero nel suo serato quando la scritta. That was one of my favorite scenes. <laughs> Lestat literally just being like, again. No, this is the note. This is the note. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Roland Jones, I mean, what, like, what an amazing gift to, to an actor to write a scene like that. It was just like, oh, I couldn't believe when I was reading it. And then it dawned on me that I was like, oh, I'm going to have to play piano, sing, and speak Italian, and kill somebody. And then, you know, like, and <laughs> I was like, holy shit. But yeah, yeah, exactly. Don't be pitchy. Don't screw it up. You know, otherwise you will die. Yeah. But if, if you're good, you know, he'll lavish you with praise and... <laughs> Flowers every day. If you are a good musician or artist in his eyes, he will make sure that you are felt appreciated. If you're bad, yes, you'll die. <laughs> <laughs> so the stakes are pretty chill. Yeah. Okay. So either <laughs> either you have a patron for life or you die. Yeah. Now, before you leave, we are going to end with a little segment that we like to call a little taste. Mm. Without giving away any spoilers, can you give us a little taste of what is to come in future episodes? A little hint of something people <laughs> might want to look out for. I know, without a spoiler, it's very tricky. Um, whoa. So um, there's so much. And yeah, I, I'd say you get to see more gifts. Mm. I would say the cloud gift is coming. <laughs> <gasps> Ooh, 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 write it down, you guys, write it down. <laughs> Keep an eye out. Ah, uh, Sam Reed. You know what? You ain't no evil vampire. You a good actor. <laughs> Thanks for coming and talking to me, all things episode two. You're the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> 